This is a Honda S2000. And it's a little different from most of the cars I review. That's because it's bright pink and highly modified and it was in a movie. This S2000 had a starring role in Too Fast, Too Furious, which was the second movie in the Fast and the Furious franchise. And today, I'm going to review it. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my new online enthusiast car auction website with cool cars from the modern era being auctioned every single day. If you're looking to sell a cool car from the 1980s and up, Cars and Bids is the place to sell it. You'll get the best community and the most money for your car. And if you're looking to buy a cool car from that era, Cars and Bids has some very interesting vehicles, as you can see here. Check out Cars and Bids at carsandbids.com. I've borrowed this S2000 from the Peterson Museum here in Los Angeles, which has one of the most incredible car collections and displays ever assembled. If you're in Los Angeles and you want to see the coolest car museum, check out the Peterson. You can also check out the Peterson Museum by clicking the link in the description below. So let's talk S2000. Now, you probably already know the S2000. It was Honda's rear-wheel drive sports car made from 2000 to 2009. And just about every enthusiast knows, manual transmission, rear-wheel drive, two-seater. It was a fantastic car, one of the very best sports cars made during the 2000s. But then there's this S2000. This S2000 was in Too Fast, Too Furious, and it had a prominent role. It was driven by Suki in a street race against an R34 Skyline GTR, a Supra, and an RX-7. And the S2000 famously jumps a drawbridge in order to avoid coming in last place. Now, this car didn't actually jump a drawbridge, but it wasn't all special effects either. More on that in a few minutes. For now, I'm going to review this S2000, and I'm going to show you all of the interesting quirks and features of a movie car, an actual car that starred in an actual movie, and not just any movie, but Too Fast, Too Furious, which really was a gem of the franchise. <laughs> Then I'm going to take it out on the road and see how it drives, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Too Fast, Too Furious S2000 on the outside. I want to talk about all the stuff you see, and frankly, I think it's pretty cool, pretty well done, very striking. Now, in the movie, this car was driven by Suki, obviously a female character, and apparently they wanted a color scheme to suit, so they went with pink, and then they have these graphics on the side. These were airbrushed by an artist named Noah Elias, who did a few other movie cars and some other art car type things and you can see all the graphics look really nice on the outside of this car frankly it's a pretty cool look given what they were going for they did a good job and of course since this car would be on film an important car in some important scenes they wanted to make it look its best so in addition to the paint scheme the airbrushing they also added a body kit a veil side kit you can see in the front there's this lower chin spoiler which is incredibly low it makes transporting this car quite a chore you also had modified rocker panels down the side again to give this car a more striking eye-catching look and in back you had a different rear bumper again to make this stand out compared to a regular S2000. And exterior mods didn't stop there. There was still more. You can see the giant wing in back, also painted pink, also to help give this car an eye-catching look. And the cover over the top area with the top down, again, a modified accessory, also painted pink, and also helps complete the special look of this car. On the outside, this car looks tremendously well done with the art, the body kit, the coloring. It really looks nice from the outside and that makes sense because that's where it was going to be shown on film so they needed it to look good and to look representative of a car that belonged in a Fast and Furious movie.
But ultimately, the thing about movie cars is they're designed to look good for a purpose on camera. And in this car's case, its purpose was being seen from the outside while Suki drives it in that street race. And so, when you get inside this S2000 and start to look at the details, things kind of fall apart. We'll start on the door panel where you can see it's fuzzy. This is a bath mat that has been cut and repurposed to fit the S2000 door panel. I am not exaggerating, this is a literal fuzzy bath mat like you'd buy at Target stuck on the door panel and that's where that fluff comes from. It's the same deal on the seats. You can see the material surrounding the seats also fuzzy, also bath mat. <laughs> <laughs> this is what this is, again, for a movie. They're not necessarily going for the highest quality stuff, just what will look good on camera in the scenes they need. And so the bath mat did the trick. And there's more bath mat in the center too. You can see on the lid of the center console, it's fluffy. That also is repurposed bath mat, just like everything else. Probably the worst part is the gear lever, the shift boot is, again, repurposed bath mat. It's actually pretty well done. It just doesn't really look that great. Right. Now, you might be wondering, why bath mat? Why did they use fluffy bathroom rugs for the interior of this car? Well, like I mentioned, it looked good on camera, but it especially looked good on camera back then. The movie was in 2003. 17 years ago, this bath mat all looked pretty nice. And you can actually see it in a few scenes, and it just looks like custom shaggy fluffy seats. Of course, being bathroom rug material, it hasn't really aged all that well. And this is what it looks like today. Of course, if you actually wanted fluffy seats in your car, you wouldn't use a bathroom rug, but they only needed the seats to look good and fluffy for a few scenes 17 years ago. And next up, continuing with the rather questionable modifications to this car, you move into the center console where you have carpeting, sort of a reddish blackish carpet in the center. Not exactly sure why that went in there. It certainly doesn't look good. Maybe it was to minimize reflection or something like that, but the center console is carpeted. Same deal in the center control stack with the cover over the stereo. There's this little piece of felt glued on here. If you press this, it opens up and you can see the stereo, but for some reason when it's closed, they've put this felt on here. I'm not exactly sure why. That's just some movie magic in another questionable mod. And things don't get better from there. One of the effects the film crew wanted while the car was being driven on camera was sort of a pink glow coming from the interior to match the exterior. And so they put lights all throughout the interior installed in a rather sloppy manner. You can see, for instance, a little light next to the seat between the seat and the door panel. You have that on the driver and on the passenger side, there's another one there. You also have a light in the center behind the fire extinguisher, which could provide more pink glow. And you have two more lights in the center console near the parking brake and shift lever. Again, these would provide that pink glow when they were switched on and the car was being driven on camera. Now, once again, this created a little bit of a problem. If you wanted a pink glow to come from your interior, you would go to great lengths to hide the lights and integrate them into your interior panels. But if you just wanted the pink glow to appear in a movie, for a few seconds of screen time, you would glue the lights to the interior as crappily as possible. And you can see just excess glue so that the lights would stay in place. They didn't need to make it look good. They just needed to make the pink glow appear. And so that's a functional decision. And the questionable modifications continue from there. Over on the passenger side of the dashboard, you can see there are three gauges. You have boost, temperature, and water temperature. And if you unhook these gauges, you can see they're connected to something with wires, but nothing functional. I'd already driven the car a little bit earlier and these gauges don't do anything, but they certainly look cool as props, which is probably what they're doing there. And it's the same story next to the gauge cluster where you have another gauge, a giant one. This is a tachometer, which again is a questionable modification because it's placed right next to the actual tachometer in the car. Not really sure you need both, but they put it there because it looks cool on camera. And it certainly does, but again, it isn't functional, it doesn't work. But the most obvious modification to the dashboard comes over on the passenger side where you have this 
Panasonic screen on like a mountain sticking up from the dashboard. Now in the movie, Suki actually watches something on this screen either right before the race or during the race, I don't remember, and you can see it pretty prominently in the movie. And it looked cool, a screen like that in your car. What you don't see in the movie is just how sloppy the placement of that screen is. It looks like they just removed the airbag so they would have enough room to stick this in here and then they placed it and it just hasn't held up well over time but again, didn't really matter all that much since it only needed to look good for a few scenes on film. And by the way, speaking of removing the airbag, this car has also had its driver side airbag removed because it has an aftermarket Sparco steering wheel. And you can also see that coming off the wheel, there are two red buttons labeled N2O Nitrous. These buttons, of course, don't do anything. You press them and absolutely nothing happens. Although there are some wires behind them that go somewhere. So maybe they did something at one point, but they're certainly not working now. And speaking of removing safety features, this car has no seat belts, which is interesting. You'd think you'd just be able to tell the person driving the car on screen, hey, don't wear the seat belt. But instead, they just outright removed it, it's gone. So driving this around, not exactly the safest experience with no airbags and no seat belts. And by the way, more on that steering wheel during the driving portion, let's just say that the fact that it has fake nitrous buttons and the airbag has been removed are the least of that steering wheel's worries, you'll see what I mean. And actually, there's one more questionable safety modification to mention. That would be the rear view mirror. For some reason, it's been moved from its original location and it hangs down on this metal piece from the top of the windshield frame. I'm not exactly sure why they did this. I suspect it's because they wanted to make sure the mirror wouldn't block camera angles showing the driver's face when she was behind the wheel, so they had to move it. But either way, the mirror is now dramatically more flimsy than before, and frankly, a little bit too low to give you a good view behind you, it's not really the most functional thing. Another questionable safety modification in the interest of Hollywood cinematic glory. And next we move under the hood where the modifications continue, including a rather desirable modification. This car is supercharged. You can actually see the Paxton supercharger in here, bringing it more power, which is kind of surprising for a movie car. Usually they just lie about modifications and more power. This car actually has a supercharger. And it also says supercharged on a label under the hood. I suspect that's because they created several different versions of this car for the movie, but this one was the hero car, the one she actually drove. It was probably the only one that actually got the supercharger. With that said, there are some rather questionable modifications under the hood, starting with the pink. And I don't mean the fact that they spray painted underneath the hood pink. I mean the fact that there's pink overspray basically everywhere else. You can see on the sides of the engine bay, there's just pink all over a lot of different engine components on the passenger side and on the driver's side. This car was clearly painted very carelessly before its final beautiful airbrushed paint was applied. All that overspray proves they clearly didn't really care all that much. And throughout the car, you can tell that areas were spray painted pink if they thought they probably wouldn't appear on camera, but maybe they would, so let's spray paint it just to be safe. But you can see the spray paint pink doesn't really match up to the exterior color pink, but it was pink nonetheless. Again, it needed to look good from 10 feet away or for a split second on camera, and so spray paint was clearly the way to go. And next up, another questionable modification under here. You had more neon lights, which I assume gave off more pink glow. You can see they're mounted on the underside of the hood. And again, they're just glued on in a very sloppy manner. No one cared how it looked as long as they stayed in place. Now, these lights really are the definition of a low quality installation. For one thing, there's this little pack that I guess turns on and off the light. You can see on the driver's side, it's taped on. <laughs> 
literally taped in place to make sure it doesn't fall off. Meanwhile, if you look at the battery, you can see these lights are literally hooked into the battery. Doesn't necessarily look like the safest way to do it, but it's what they did because again, the car only needed to have that pink glow for a couple seconds of screen time. And also the last interesting item up here, at the very front of the engine bay, you can see there's a label that reads, first unit principal car only. Now, like I mentioned, there were other pink S2000s made for the movie, but this was the principal car. In other words, the hero car, the most important main car that looked the best and was going to be used on screen the most. But it wasn't the car that made the jump. For that interesting story, I must borrow some knowledge from Craig Lieberman, who was involved in the Fast and the Furious movie production, and specifically the car stuff. He has a YouTube channel where he tells a lot of stories about the Fast and the Furious movies, which I will link in the description below. Now, Craig Lieberman says that multiple S2000s were made, including a remote control version. So there was a pink S2000 looked just like this, except it could be driven with a remote control. And it was that one that went off a ramp, not actually a drawbridge, but it completed a jump with a driver driving it via remote from elsewhere, which is pretty cool. Now, Craig Lieberman also says that the chase car, the camera car, which was a Dodge Durango, couldn't stop in time when the S2000 went off the ramp, and it too went off the ramp with stunt people driving, and they suffered minor injuries as a result. But the S2000 did actually complete the jump, just not this S2000, and not with an actual human being driving, just a remote control setup. Pretty cool. And finally, we move around to the back of the S2000, and specifically the trunk. You open up the trunk lid with this giant wing on it, and you can see inside the trunk, well, just like everywhere else, it doesn't really look all that nice. This part was never going to be shown on camera, and so they didn't have to care about how it looks and so it looks bad. <laughs> now, this car has a fuel cell in place of the original fuel tank. That's part of the reason it looks so bad back here. They basically had to cut out a spot to mount the fuel cell, and I must say it definitely smells like fuel when you pop open the trunk, and that is the culprit. And next up, another interesting item worth noting around back. Underneath the trunk area, you can see this body kit bumper has cutouts for exhaust tips, and in the movie, the car had some upgraded, modified exhaust tips on it, although I'm told they weren't functional. Now, you get under the car, you can see the exhaust actually exits somewhere in the middle below the car, so those exhaust tips really probably were just for show, but either way, they're not on the car anymore. Not sure what happened to them. They're lost to time in the 17 years since this movie was made. Also underneath the car in the back, you can again see more overspray, I guess from spray paint. Just really does not look all that good, but again, they really didn't care. No one was ever going to see this until right now. And finally, as for the S2000 itself, the non-too-fast, too-furious version, if you want to see the quirks and features of that, I have reviewed a normal S2000 and kind of gone through a full tour of that car. Obviously very different from the movie car, but if you want to see a regular non-movie modified S2000, I will link that video in the description below. And so those are the quirks and features of the too-fast, too-furious Honda S2000. S2000. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Suki S2000. It has just occurred to me, I drive the car first, it has just occurred to me that it does not have seat belts. And as I'm saying this, by the way, I am also realizing that the steer <laughs> that the steering wheel, when you're going straight, is at a 45 degree angle. <laughs> So I'm dead straight and the wheel is obviously turned. So it was not installed properly. Nobody during filming cares about stuff like this. Sitting at a stoplight, you really get the chance to fully take in the experience of what this car is. I'm driving it before recording the part that you saw earlier with the quirks and features and it's just so bad. Movie cars are just so bad. No attempt is made 
to make them look good unless it really is going to be shown closely on camera. Otherwise, they just want it to be as functional as possible. And so you have these gauges that don't work, but they look cool. And you have this screen that's just absurd. It's like glued in there in place of the airbag, I've just realized. Uh, but it looks cool and blah, blah, blah. You can go through a lot of this stuff. Everything in here just looks like it is the part, like it looks like a Fast and the Furious car, except it's all crap. Of course, then there's also the aspect of this sheer embarrassment of driving around Los Angeles in a bright pink <laughs> S2000. This is just really not how I want to be spending my time. Also, I've just realized it may not be limited to 4,000 RPM, but unlike every other S2000, which kind of comes alive between 4 and 5,000 RPM, this one has basically nothing above 4 or 5,000 RPM. I'm not entirely sure why, but I imagine they've disabled something or the car is just, it needs, it needs work from sitting for so long. I pull up at a red light and I want to straighten out the wheel because that's what you do. But if you do that, then that sends the car to the left. Straight wheel sends the car to the left. It doesn't really work. But anyway, it doesn't appear that the car really wants to rev above four or 5,000 RPM. Um, I don't know if that was intentional for the movie. They didn't want it getting going too fast or what the deal was, but I'm flooring it at four. It makes noise, <laughs> but that's about all that it makes. I don't know if the clutch is going or what the deal is, but this is how movie cars are. Again, they're just not treated all that well. It doesn't matter to people. Uh, it's just, does it work? Does it do what we need it to for the scene? That's all that we really care about. And it doesn't matter how many holes you drill in it or bad glue you know, applications you do. As long as it works, that's what's important for a movie. The problem though is when you put on the, <laughs> when you put on the turn signal to turn, it requires you to straighten the wheel back out for the turn signal to turn off. But if you straighten out the wheel, <laughs> oh no, turn signal just doesn't cancel. <laughs> Sorry, I assumed it did. I, I was, why would I make such a silly assumption? I gotta be honest, even here in LA, where nothing attracts people's attention. Everybody's focused on themselves. They've seen a million celebrities. Nothing is cool anymore. Even here in LA, people are staring at me. Now, I'm not about to say that it's because I'm cool. It's because I'm driving around in a bright pink S2000 and I look like a complete idiot. But it is kind of neat. Overall, the way that I would describe this car is bad. Uh, the interior is a disaster. It looks terrible. Uh, it's a lot of stuff doesn't seem to be working. It's just a nightmare, but it gives you great insight into what happens during a production and how a movie car you know, gets made and what is involved in all that. They don't need it to look good, they just need it to look good enough. So the exterior of this car is cool as hell. I mean, it worked so well for the movie, it looked great on screen, but you get in the car, you drive it, you're just on a normal Tuesday in LA, you start to realize this isn't all it's cracked up to be. But that in itself is super interesting. And so that's the Honda S2000 from Too Fast, Too Furious. This car is obviously ridiculous. It's ridiculous on the outside, it's ridiculous on the inside, and it has some very questionable modifications. But it's really cool to spend a day with a movie car and check out its quirks and features. This certainly isn't a regular S2000, but it is a fairly famous one. And now it's time to give this S2000 a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, I actually like the body kit and I like how it looks, but pink leaves a little something to be desired and it gets a 6 out of 10. Acceleration, because of whatever mechanical flaw won't let it really accelerate, it's nowhere near as fast as the original, I'm giving it a 1 out of 10. Handling also doesn't quite feel up to par, but it's still an S2000 so it's quite nice and it gets a 7 out of 10. Fun factor is okay, it doesn't accelerate very fast and there are no seat belts so it's a bit more terror factor than fun factor and it gets a 6 out of 10. Finally, cool factor, and this is high. Imagine driving around in an actual Fast and the Furious movie car. It gets an 8 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 28 out of 50. 
Next up are the daily categories and features. It's the same as a regular S2000. It has the basics and it gets a 3 out of 10. Comfort is also the same as a regular S2000 and it gets a 4 out of 10. Quality is lower. It started out life as a regular S2000, but then it got lights glued inside it and bathroom rugs stuck to the panels. Now it gets a 4 out of 10. Practicality is less than a regular S2000. The trunk is taken up by a fuel-smelling fuel cell and drivability is hampered by the steering wheel issue and the no seat belts and it gets a 1 out of 10. Finally, value, and I have no idea what this would sell for, but whatever it is, it's a cool movie car. There's real value in there unless it's just massive money. It gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 18 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 46 out of 100, which places this S2000 here against other Japanese sports cars from this era. The simple truth is this thing is worse than a regular S2000, much worse, but it's also cooler. And it's interesting to see what a real movie car is like up close. The answer is highly compromised, but it sure looked nice on screen. Hey!